And now, um, with five minutes advan advance on schedule, which is really quite extraordinary, <laughs> I am uh, extremely pleased uh, to uh, give the floor to Tania Manuelos Mejia, uh, who is Program Management Officer at the uh, Division for Treaty Affairs of UNODC. Uh, she has been working with the convention and specifically assisting the Conference of the Parties uh, for quite a number of years now. And she is in a very, very good position to give us uh, the opening speech that we have envisaged, uh, which deals with the Palermo Convention, a general presentation and uh, discussing the limits, the potentials and the challenges uh, of the convention. Thank you very much for being here and you have the floor and maybe also the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the conference organizers for inviting UNODC as secretary to the Conference of the Parties to UNTOC uh, to participate in this very important and informative academic event, which is timely in many ways. As Professor uh, has mentioned, it commemorates the 15 years since the entry into force of the Organized Crime Convention it looks ahead to the upcoming 20th anniversary of the convention's adoption by the General Assembly. And of course, it serves as an opportune platform to examine the state of play of the implementation of the convention and its protocols, given the recent and long awaited establishment of the review mechanism. I have been asked to speak briefly about some of the topics which the panels will delve into later today, and in particular to focus on the limits, challenges and potentials of the UNTOC and its protocols over the past 20 years and looking ahead. I therefore must touch upon both substantive matters dealing with the scope of application and implementation of the convention, as well as more general and overarching political issues that inevitably have an effect on the real and potential use of the UNTOC by states parties. I would also like to provide some food for thought on how states parties, the conference secretariat and civil society can continue to bolster the implementation of the Convention and its protocols in the years to come. I will start by mentioning some of the positive achievements relating to the implementation of the Palermo Convention. The Convention has practically reached universal adherence with 189 parties at present, while the protocols also have high levels of adherence. Clearly, there exists consensus among states' parties that transnational organized crime and other forms of serious crime pose a common threat to the international community that can only be faced through concerted action. The General Assembly has recently recognized that thanks to its nearly universal adherence and wide scope of application, the Organized Crime Convention overs, offers a fundamental basis for international cooperation to support the investigation and prosecution of the crimes it covers, including for extradition, mutual legal assistance and confiscation and asset recovery, and that it provides an effective mechanism that should be further implemented and utilized in practice. Indeed, discussions taking place within the working groups of the conference and during the sessions of the conference itself point to the fact that the UNTOC's criminalization provisions have been widely incorporated into domestic law. Moreover, the use of the Convention for International Cooperation in Criminal Matters is noticeably on the rise. This has been stated explicitly by practitioners at the meetings of the, of the COP Working Group on International Cooperation and can also be observed in the ever more specific topics that the Working Group chooses to discuss. For example, at the, its last meeting in October 2018, the Working Group discussed the topic of challenges faced in expediting the extradition process, including addressing health and safety and other human rights issues. The interest in using the international cooperation provisions of the Convention is also evidenced by the increasing number of requests for technical assistance that UNODC receives in this area, which relate not only to the crimes covered by the UNTOC and its protocols, but also to other forms of serious crime. To be sure, the wide scope of application of the Convention is unquestionably one of its main strengths. The UNTOC can and has been used to tackle money laundry, trafficking and cultural property, cybercrime, wildlife and forest crimes, counterfeit goods, crime and the fishing industry, among others. Resolutions adopted by the Conference of the Party to UNTOC, as well as by other relevant intergovernmental bodies, have increasingly given UNODC mandates to produce tools and provide trainings and workshops 
in which the UNTOC provisions on confiscation, joint investigations, special investigative techniques, among others, are discussed. And of course, the recent establishment of the review mechanism is without a doubt the greatest achievement for both the Conference of the Parties and for UNODC over the last year. It will undoubtedly strengthen the implementation of the Convention and its protocols and will boost the objectives of the Convention to promote cooperation to prevent and combat transnational organized crime more effectively. However, these positive gains have not always come free of obstacles. Starting with the review mechanism itself, its establishment was debated by the conference for over a decade. During this time, there were a few main points of contention, which you may all be familiar with, including the participation of civil society in the review process and the matter of funding. More recently, additional points of contention began to emerge. For example, the extent to which the secretariat should be involved in the review process and whether the review should build upon the review of other relevant instruments. All these points may certainly have merit in themselves. Nevertheless, it is clear to many observers that other, not necessarily legal or budgetary issues, form the base for these contentions. In fact, many times it has been a lack of political will and or interest that has hampered the negotiations over the review mechanism. And it has also hampered some of the operational aspects of the international cooperation provisions of the convention. This lack of political will has been accompanied by other more structural situations. One is, unfortunately, the crisis faced by multilateralism that is actually hardly unique to just the UNTOC, UNODC, or even just the UN. This has been exacerbated by realities and lack of consensus surrounding other issues, such as gun, gun laws in some countries and the migration and refugee crises in Europe and elsewhere that have caused friction within and among states. Moreover, throughout the years, the UNTOC, including its ratification and the adoption of a review mechanism, has also faced challenges when other international concerns have seemed more urgent, terrorism, corruption, piracy, cybercrime. Nonetheless, there is a growing realization based on concrete evidence that strong links can and do exist between organized crime in its many forms and terrorism, piracy, evasion and violation of international economic and financial sanctions, to name a few. Since a few years ago, the General Assembly has repeatedly expressed grave concern about the negative effects of all manifestations of transnational organized crime on development, peace, stability, and security, and human rights. Because of this realization and recognition of the grave impact that transnational organized crime has on societies, economies, and governments, and because of the links between it and other forms of serious crime, the UNTOC is gaining renewed relevance and momentum which has been appropriately complemented by the review mechanism. Here I should add that in the face of all these changing obstacles and circumstances, it has truly been the tireless and relentless efforts of a few states parties that has kept the process of negotiations alive and led to the ultimate establishment of the review mechanism. So after this brief overview of the past, what are some of the main limits, potentials, and challenges looking forward? In my personal opinion, and based on my observations over the years, I think that one of the main challenges for both the UNTOC and member states relates to the area of cybercrime and how to deal with it effectively through international law, especially as regards international cooperation. Cybercrime is both a means to the commission of criminal offenses and an end in itself. Information and communication technologies are used alike by particular individuals, groups, and governments to commit acts, many of which are still unregulated and undefined. The crisis of multilateralism that I mentioned earlier is both fueled by and contributes to the climate of mistrust and divergence of views among UN member states as to the best way to bring cybercrime within the realm of international law. It will be interesting to see whether the UNTOC enjoys enough acceptance to be used to cooperate in combating this type of crime or whether its international cooperation and jurisdiction provisions are insufficient for member states. Some ideas that have been put, put, been put forward by member states include, for example, drafting a new cybercrime instrument under the aegis of the UN, or drafting a protocol on this matter that would be supplementary to the Organized Crime Convention. In addition, the UNTOC needs to be complemented and used in conjunction with other legal instruments and international standards and norms. 
First and foremost, as it deals with matters of criminal justice, the implementation of the UNTOC must be carried out in full compliance with and in the context of international human rights obligations, especially as regards non-derogable rights. In fighting against organized crime, governments cannot forget or ignore their obligations to guarantee the human rights of their populations, including the rights of the accused, as well as of victims and witnesses, and the imposition of appropriate and proportionate sanctions. Moreover, the flexibility of the UNTOC can be complemented by its combined application with other instruments and international norms, such as the uh, Corruption Convention, the FATF regulations, instruments related to the transfer of cultural objects, international humanitarian law, especially as relates to smuggling of migrants and trafficking in persons, the terrorism conventions, instruments dealing with disarmament, and the international drug control conventions, to name a few. To conclude, I would like to put forward some ideas as to how the implementation of the convention, its protocols, can be further promoted. The Secretariat, civil society, including academia, and governments can work together to assist states that have not yet done so to adhere to the instruments, for example, through advocacy and legislative assistance. Academia and civil society can remain engaged and interested in supporting and providing a knowledge base for governments in their efforts to implement the UNTOC and its protocols, including in the context of the review mechanism. This should include continuing to study and disseminate evidence-based research on the impact of transnational organized crime on the ground so as to provide policy options for governments. Furthermore, while much information on the implementation of the UNTOC and the protocols thereto is already contained in the UNODC data management portal known as Sherlock, the review mechanism will provide the mandate and resources to truly collect, categorize, and analyze the data provided by states in order to identify remaining gaps and challenges. For this purpose, it is vital for states' parties to remain interested and engaged in the process, inter alia, but very crucially, by providing sufficient resources to the Conference Secretariat and to UNODC as the guardian of the Convention so that they can carry out the role envisaged in the Convention. I thank you for your attention, and I remain at your disposal for any questions you may have also regarding the work of UNODC, and I look forward to today's discussions. I think uh, there could be many questions already. I don't know if anybody wishes to raise them or maybe we can go back to some of the topics during the discussion also in the panels, but if anybody has a question. Uh All the, thank you very much. All the groups which are participating and that make things much more difficult to achieve progress. Is there a similar development in the area of terrorism, organized crime, and so on? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I wouldn't be able to speak uh, specifically about terrorism, but in the area of organized crime, I think that um, currently, there aren't that many uh, differences in opinions as regards, for example, what should be criminalized and what are obviously the criminalization provisions in the UNTOC. Um, also in relation to the practical aspects of international cooperation, there seems to be uh, a lot of agreement on, on the fact that they're useful. Of course, they also, um, there also needs to be more discussion or there is always discussion about how they can be more uh, practically implemented or facilitated. But I think that in, in the UNTOC suffered um, 
through various um, kind of crises throughout the years for different reasons that not necessarily had to do with the convention itself. Um, for example, of course, the UNCAC review mechanism came first. So after that, there was a, a little bit of a loss of momentum from the states, parties, and the conference to UNTOC to then go ahead and continue, and, and it would take a lot of effort and money to then establish the review mechanism for UNTOC. So it took a long time in that sense. Then I think that um, I think that um, there really was a, a real divergence of views regarding participation of civil society. For many years, this was actually a real preoccupation for some states. Uh, as to how much they would allow civil society and academia to participate in the review conference for issues of sovereignty, impartiality, etc. Uh, I think that over the years this has also changed and um, as we saw last year in the establishment when they finally adopted the resolution, this really just became uh, something that they, they figured out at the end of the day rather practically. After many years of thinking about it, they decided that they really needed to just address this and they did. So it wasn't obviously something that couldn't be overcome. And of course the funding. And the funding issue, I think this is really reflecting the state of multilateralism because there's just a lack, uh, it, the mechanism at the end, the way they, um, they uh, um, structured it uh, is, is um, let's say, light and minim minimal, minimalistic. It's not that expensive. So perhaps it's not necessarily just a question of, of, of money, although of course it's a concern for all governments, but it's more a willingness to invest in a, a process that will be very long um, and, um, and, and to commit the resources also from their practitioners who will participate in the review process. So, so in summary, I think that the, the subject matter itself is not extremely controversial. There's a recognition of the problem but then the practical implementation is the one that has been more difficult. Thank you very much. Um, I also step in with a question relating to funding. Um, uh, how much is the problem of uh, the need to get year targeted uh, funds from states, the fact that several activities are not covered by the regular budget, a problem in the a daily management of the convention? Yeah, that's a very good question <laughs> that occupies our minds uh, regularly. Um, the, so the work of the conference itself, the regular work of the conference, the sessions and the working groups are covered by the regular budget of the UN. Um, however, um, for the review mechanism, which of course is a, a lot more money, um, uh, it has not been covered by the regular budget. So, so far, it um, has not been decided that the General Assembly will dedicate regular budgets for this review process. Um, having said that, it was also agreed that what we now have, we currently have under the regular budget will of course be dedicated also 100% to the review mechanism. Um, but yes, that was one of the main concerns of many states and primarily I think of the Secretariat that we needed to, um, we, we many times emphasized and recalled that we need to have sustainable and predictable funding in order to be able to really be able to carry out the activities um, and to be able to ensure that in the next two, three, four, five years, the working groups or the, the, the review process itself will take place. Um, so if we get a little bit of money every now and then, it's very difficult to plan. And if, um, if something happens and there's not enough funds, then of course the review process go gets, uh, gets um, behind schedule. And, um, and, and then of course th that's a loss of, I guess, also um, m momentum and um, interest on the part of member states if they see that things aren't working out as they should be. So this is an issue that I think is ongoing. Uh, of course the secretary is engaging in, in fundraising, but it's really not just up to the secretariat, of course, the state's parties are the the main uh, actors who should be interested in providing these funds. And of course, some of them already have, including uh, Italy, who has been one of the main promoters throughout. Yeah. Uh, may, I just on, may I just come in on this question? Uh, we have this question in the UN in general, extraordinary funding, voluntary contributions, but not only by states, but also by entities, let's call it uh, companies, NGOs, um, in other sources. Uh, is there this an issue 
at how, who may contribute and how do you look after the funds. We have, have this uh, thing about UNEP when I think it was Bill Gates uh, provided voluntary contributions as a private entity. Was UNEP entitled to accept this or not? Is there any discussions like this going on in UN ODC? Um, I'm not 100% uh, familiar with the rules and regulations re uh, regulating or governing the budget because it's extremely complicated. But um, I believe that it is possible for other entities or entities other than governments to provide funds. Um, in the case of the conference, we have not had that situation at all. Um, no one has come forward to offer funds, <laughs> only member states. Um, so th that is not something that is currently being discussed. I do know that for some other programs, some of the more technical ones, we actually need to partner with some private sector companies. So sometimes the contributions are also in kind. And um, as long as there is a due diligence process and vetting, it's generally accepted. Any other question? Please. I can also just speak loudly. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a possible cyber crime uh, convention. And what this made me think about was um, what about the fact that uh, cyber crime is often state sponsored? And of course, all of these transnational criminal law treaties uh, are premised on the idea that states are actually not involved in the conduct. So how would that be dealt with? Yeah, I think that's one of the main uh, points of contention, actually. Um, so of course, thank you. Uh, the, the, what I mentioned about a possible instrument is only one of the, ma uh, one of the many ideas that has been yeah. put forward. A lot of countries are against that idea. So right now it's, it's, let's say, under discussion and under constant evolution, the, how to deal with cybercrime. But of course, that is one of the main points. Who is carrying out these crimes or acts are they state-sponsored? Um, and that would be, of course, outside the scope of organized crime. Um, if it's state-sponsored, I mean, they are also discussing it as a crime of aggression, et cetera. So it really, I think, is one of the main things. But as regards, uh, or as it relates to the UNTOC, um, one of the main areas where UNTOC could be used is international cooperation. But um, I think many states feel that it's not sufficient. They are not sufficient. They need something more specific, and of course, a lot of countries have a lot more specific laws. And of course, the Council of Europe has a treaty on cybercrime that regulates it. They think more efficiently than the UNTA could. So, and there's the issue of jurisdiction, which is really, you know, when you access um, data that is stored elsewhere. So, things that are inherent to to cybercrime. So, yeah, that is one of the many okay. situations. Thank you. And I think we can now shift places and uh, begin the first.